I often speak to a lot of young students as well as new grads about software engineering. And recently I've noticed the sentiment is that it's really difficult to find junior level positions. Consequently, the main question right now is whether or not going into software engineering is still the right path. In this video, we will go into the reasons why the job market is so poor right now, how does AI impact the job market, and then in the end, come to a conclusion whether or not it's too late to become a software engineer. So for those of you who are new to this channel, my name is George, and I am a software engineer at Amazon. In general, I make career and tech videos about software engineers. It would mean the world to me if you could click like and subscribe. It really helps the algorithm and I am a really new channel. Now, I graduated with a neuroscience degree before transitioning to computer science in 2020. I do feel that I am really in a good position to comment about the job markets and how it's been recently. As most software engineers who are more senior in position might not really know what the market is like for junior roles. So during that COVID time between 2019, 2020, all the way up to mid 2022, the job market was super hot and I was a part of that ridiculous frenzy. So if you look at the data here, just between 2019 to 2022, Amazon increased by 106%, Meta 103. There was a huge increase during COVID time in hiring. And I won't go too into detail about what was happening during COVID, but you can pause the video here and take a look at the stats during the time. The idea is that people were staying home and there were a lot of digital services being used. Something that I will address later on is if the economy itself was doing super well and if this was sustainable for the tech industry as a whole. But back then, they overhired like crazy. Anecdotally, I just remember the market being really, really good. Recruiters were just reaching out to everyone trying to fill quotas. They were even asking people who worked at the company to find potential candidates and give referrals. I myself, as a science student with no CS background, I got my first interview at Google, which was crazy at the time to me. And the point is, is that at that time, they were just trying to look to hire as many people as possible. Now, the question of whether or not it was sustainable, spoiler, it was not. And there were some stats post COVID that show a lot of this. There was a decline in mobile app ads, app downloads. There were revenue declines across the board for all major tech companies. And in the end, a lot of these companies had to end up making tough choices in terms of layoffs. And I remember I had just joined the company at the time and they were announcing massive layoffs. And it was a, a, a crazy thing to be a part of when you were first entering the, uh, at least for me, when I was first entering the industry. Now, experience taught me something very valuable about career decisions, which is something that I will touch on. However, this showed that the economy during COVID was unsustainable and companies had to cut back and de-risk. So what I noticed about this is tech is super sensitive to Wall Street. Basically, if the revenues are going good, if there is projected growth that seems to be going high up, which is what was happening during COVID, they're going to take a lot of risk and try to hire as many people as possible to be competitive. And their stock is largely dictating how much they're planning to hire or not hire. Now on the opposing side, if there isn't a lot of confidence from Wall Street, meaning the stocks were going down back in late 2022, going to 2023, then they need to do layoffs. And it's mostly for de-risking. And to decrease the workforce the most while still being productive is to remove a lot of those junior positions. By cutting those roles, Companies aimed to improve sort of their short-term financial reports, presenting a healthier picture to investors during their quarterly earnings. So going back to what this experience taught me, what I realized was that in certain teams where their revenue streams were very healthy, it was hard to take people away from those positions because they were cash cows for those companies. However, in a lot of these big companies, like for example, Google, Amazon, Meta, they try to have a lot of experimental teams. And when the economy is good, it's really easy to take a high flyer on those things because there is a potential opportunity there to create a new product, to create a new vertical. However, during the de-risking phase, a lot of those roles get taken away. Now, for example, these included things like Amazon Music, Kindle Books, um, in Meta, there were a lot of cuts within Oculus VR, things like that. And when you join these big companies, you can choose the team that you join until these layoffs happen, and then you're kind of stuck with the team that you're with. And that's because for, again, the pros for joining a lot of these experimental teams is that it might be easier to get a promotion because you're building new products. You might be working on new technologies, whereas cons is the amount of risk that you incur within your job. And this is something that I learned from basically this experience. And this will be super important as well in terms of risk versus reward. 
whether it's too late to go into software engineering or not. So I will touch a little bit more about this risk versus risk reward aspect. Now, before I go into that, I want to mention during this time, I read a lot about Ray Dalio and learned that overall we are technically in a global recession. He does go into detail about how these recessions work and how we recover from these cycles. So I highly recommend if you wanna learn more about how the financial cycle works as a whole, especially because this makes a huge impact on the tech industry. Well, the final piece to all of this is we need to talk about how AI comes in. Now people worried a lot about jobs and AI taking over that. I do think that there is a risk there. However, one thing that I think is not necessarily talked about as much is the cost to actually train these various language models. So back when BERT, GPT-2, GPT-3 first started, again, the cost was you know a couple million dollars. And you look at, for example, GPT-5, they expect this to be over a billion dollars. And even Elman has, himself has said that he is expecting to create a $1 trillion data center. So the idea is, is that this will cost a significant amount. Now, I won't go into the details of what is expected there, but I will talk more so in the fact that, for example, for Amazon earnings, there's gonna be more scrutiny on all these AI tether stocks, meaning that there's a lot of tolerance for investors to not miss out on this AI opportunity, but in the future, there is probably gonna be more scrutiny on whether this makes money or not. And so even though there's a lot of fear about whether AI is gonna take away jobs, and I do think there is a legitimate risk there, Something that does need to be said is the amount of money that is needed to actually keep this AI running. What I learned from all of this is again, you need to think about how you can de-risk things for yourself and work on things that are more recession resistant, which is perhaps joining teams that already have a very healthy revenue. Uh, in addition to that, I think networks and referrals are gonna be increasingly important because a lot of these job openings may, might not be open to the public. This is something that you see a lot in other industries as well, but especially in software engineering now, hiring will be done in sort of a more de-risked way. And one of the easiest ways for companies to hire in a safer way is to get referrals from their team around them. So referrals will be increasingly important. I also think that things now will be more standardized. So now more than ever, perhaps the lead code coding questions or system design questions, they will be there and there, it will be more standardized. In addition, your grades, the school that you go to, target schools, the number of internships you'll have will probably be more standardized and will be more of a requirement than something that is a bonus compared to before. Now you already see this with coding questions because I know for um, my best friend who works as a senior engineer back in like, you know, 2010s, 2015, early 2000s, maybe you only had to like solve a couple of LeetCode question easies or you didn't have to learn, you only had to do like 50 LeetCode questions to be ready for the interviews. But now people are doing like 400, 500 questions at a time and you know, uh, LeetCode itself has like tons of questions there for, for coding interview questions. So after all this, the AI stuff, what the hiring was like back in 2020s to now where uh, the hiring is maybe slowed down compared to before, is it too late to become a software engineer? I think in order to do that, we have to make some comparisons with some of the common major professions that people typically go into. Now, I know people go into different types of professions, but I just want to cover sort of the major ones. So for example, let's say for being a lawyer, people typically say that you can make upwards to six figures as well. So this is very similar to what they do in tech. However, in order to become a lawyer, you need to take the law school exam, which is the LSAT. And I don't, I'm not exactly sure how long the exam is, but I do know that people take months to prepare for this. In addition to that, you need to do law school. You need to do law school, which is an additional four years of time. So finally, you might be able to join a big law firm where you maybe will join in m and um, things like that. And from there, that's when you start making, making a big salary. Comparison to what we have currently for computer science, software engineering, it's not as strict as what it is for becoming a lawyer. Now, being a doctor is even crazier. I know this process because originally I wanted to become a doctor. So I know for the MCAT, the exam is, I think it's seven hours and 30 minutes for a standardized process. They care a ton about grades. Lawyers do too. But for doctors, I think they have the higher standards for, I think they do say that 3.7 probably for most schools is the minimum, but I think for most doctors, having near perfect GPA is almost like a requirement, especially in North American schools. In addition to that, you have to do medical school, which typically is an additional four years. And then after that, you have to do residency. So residency is essentially doctor in training. 
And it depends on the type of specialization you do. For neurosurgery, perhaps you have to do like six to eight years. For others, it might be a little bit shorter. But the idea is, is that during residency, you're not making a huge amount of money. I mean, you're making, making maybe 60K, 70K. And only once you become a doctor do you get to like six figures, you get half a million, depending on some uh, specializations. Bank care is the same thing. You have to get internships, you have to try and get into some of the big banks, and then you try to get into buy side. And the point is, is that they already have an extensive standardized process. Now, I think if you're comparing to these other professions and if you're looking at it purely from a financial perspective or looking at it in terms of the amount of effort it would you would need to get into a good financial position, I still feel like software engineering is one of the easier paths to go through in terms of what you think about software engineering going forward, if it's still worth it. I'd love to hear your feedback or if there's anything I've missed.